Hello everybody. So in this video I'm going to discuss some of the laws that led to modern atomic theory. So the idea that matter is composed of atoms is currently what we subscribe to in the scientific community, but it hasn't always been what people, it hasn't always been the popular belief, and it may not necessarily be the scientific uh, consensus in the future, uh, but right now it's the best thing that we've got and it has hundreds of years of scientific evidence to support it. So just uh, a basic breakdown of this video. Um, first, I'm going to start talking about some of the early, uh, earliest ideas about uh, the existence of atoms. Then I'm going to go into the laws of conservation of mass, definite proportions, and multiple proportions. And then to wrap things up, I'm going to talk about Dalton's atomic theory. So a lot to go over in this video, so let's just uh, go ahead and get started. So some of the earliest ideas about the existence of atoms were floating around as early as the 5th and 4th century BC, which is a pretty long time ago. And uh, these gentlemen here on the right side of your screen, over here, uh, this is Leucippus, and on the right here is his student, Democritus. And these two guys were the first to, uh, to really propose um, the existence of atoms. So according to these guys, if you took a piece of paper and you ripped it up in half and you kept ripping it in half and ripping it in half and ripping it in half over and over and over again, eventually you, you would get to a, a very, very small but indestructible uh, particle which they called atomos, which literally means uncuttable and is the Greek word from which the word atom is derived. So that was one school of thought. Uh, proposed by Leucippus and Democritus. And then on the complete other side of the spectrum, you had guys like Aristotle and Plato. And according to them, the, uh, all matter was composed of various proportions of earth, water, fire, and air. So again, two entirely different schools of thought. But because Aristotle and Plato, Aristotle especially, because he was so uh, he was so um, influential. He was, uh, you know, very respected at the time. Uh, pretty much everybody just jumped on board with Aristotle, even though his ideas were just entirely based on philosophy and there was no scientific evidence. I mean, you know, the, the, the atomic, you know, ideas, the, you know, Leucippus and Democritus, they didn't have any scientific evidence either. So this was all, you know, speculation at the time, but it would turn out uh, that the guys who were more influential were actually more incorrect. So uh, this sort of reminds me of the Lion King. Uh, do you remember the scene in the Lion King when they're all sitting around in the grass looking up at the stars? And then Pum uh, Pumbaa says, oh, well, you know, I always thought the stars were uh, these big flaming balls of gas burning millions of miles away. And then Timon just kind of dismisses it saying, oh, well, with you, everything's gas. So in this analogy, uh, Pumbaa is like Leucippus and Democritus, and uh, uh, Aristotle and Plato are like Timon. <laughs> So, again, but, you know, this is all based on philosophy, and it wouldn't be until about 2,000 or so years later uh, that, you know, scientific experiments would start getting sophisticated enough, and the scientific method would become, you know, well-established enough uh, to actually substantiate um, the idea of the existence of atoms. So, if we fast forward all the way to the year 1789, this is when a man named Antoine Lavoisier came up with the law of conservation of mass. And the law of conservation of mass states that matter is neither created nor destroyed in a chemical reaction. So if I have any chemical reaction, uh, this example here, this is the combustion of propane, this uh, C3H8, that is propane, uh, the reaction says that propane combines with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water and the law of conservation of mass states that if I sum together the mass of propane and oxygen then I start out with initially, uh, then that's going to be equivalent to the sum of the mass of uh, carbon dioxide and water uh, that I end up with. So I should point out right now uh, that the law of conservation of mass is actually a slight oversimplification in that uh, when you start getting into nuclear reactions, uh, and you start studying the equation E equals MC squared, um, you know, we're all familiar with that equation, but few of us actually know, um, you know, what it means. And basically what it means, in a nutshell, is that, um, is that mass and energy are actually in interconvertible. You can go from one to the other and vice versa. So, but however, 
uh, in the context of ordinary chemical reactions, such as this combustion reaction down here, um, any changes in mass associated with ordinary chemical reactions are so minusculely small uh, that they can be disregarded. So for all chemical intents and purposes, uh, the law of conservation of mass is pretty is pretty solid. So now let's get into the law of definite proportions. And this was proposed a little less than a decade later after the uh, conservation of mass. And uh, this was proposed by Joseph Proust. And it says that all samples of a certain compound have the same proportion of their constituent elements. So what does this mean? Well, if I have a, uh, a 44.009 gram sample of CO2, carbon dioxide, and I analyze and, and I break it up into its constituent elements, carbon and oxygen. And if I if I take the masses of those elements, then I will get 12.001 grams of carbon and 31.998 grams of oxygen. So the idea with the law of definite proportions is, you know, if I if I take the ratio of those two masses, so if I take the mass ratio of oxygen to carbon for instance, that'll be the 31.998 grams over the 12.00, or excuse me, 12.011 grams, that ratio is going to end up being 2.6641. So this ratio is going to be the same no matter where our CO2 sample came from. So in other words, if the carbon dioxide came from a combustion reaction, if it came from cellular respiration, if it came from some other synthesis of carbon dioxide, doesn't matter how it was prepared, it's always going to have the same, as long as, assuming that it is pure carbon dioxide, it's always going to have the same 2.6641 ratio of oxygen to carbon. So that's what the law of definite proportion says. Uh, now let's move into the law of multiple proportions. And this was proposed by John Dalton uh, a little later, and it says that when two elements, so let's call them X and Y, when two elements form two different compounds, the masses of element Y that combine with a fixed mass of element X can be expressed as a ratio of small whole numbers. So that was a pretty big, you know, convoluted sentence, but, you know, please uh, let me explain. So at, the, at, at this time, John Dalton was pretty convinced that matter was composed of atoms. So in other words, if you have, uh, you know, two elements forming two different compounds, and, you know, one of those elements is, there's only one atom of it, but then you allow the atoms of the other element to change. So in other words, if I have XY1, XY2, XY3, etc., keeping the, you know, keeping the amount of atoms of X constant at one, and then allowing the, uh, the number of atoms of Y to change, then the ratio of these masses of Y, so the ratio of Y1 to Y2 to Y3, all of these ratios, uh, all of these mass ratios should turn out to be uh, whole, small whole numbers because if all of these elements have the same mass, if all atoms of the same uh, element have the same mass, and you're just multiplying them by a certain number, then that number should be reflected in the mass ratio. So that's basically all that the law of multiple proportions is saying. So let's move on to a real example. So here we have two compounds, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Uh, both of these are composed of the same two elements, carbon and oxygen. Carbon monoxide has a carbon and one oxygen. Carbon dioxide has a carbon and two oxygens. And if we keep the mass of carbon in both of these cases, uh, if, if, we, if we fix that at one gram, then the mass of oxygen in carbon monoxide is going to be 1.33 grams, and the mass of oxygen in carbon dioxide is going to be 2.67 grams. So again, we're keeping the mass of carbon fixed at one gram in both of these compounds, and we're seeing how much oxygen we get for every one gram of carbon in both cases. So, so now let's take a ratio of the two. If we take the ratio of the mass of oxygen that combines with one gram of carbon in carbon dioxide, and we divide that by the mass of oxygen that combines with one gram of carbon in carbon monoxide, if we take that ratio, then it should be 
uh, a small whole number. So if we take that 2.67 and divide it by the 1.33, then we will indeed get a small uh, whole number, which is 2. So this is all uh, that the law of multiple proportions is saying. So with all of these laws in mind, there was now you know, quite a bit of evidence to substantiate uh, the existence of atoms. And it was at this point uh, that Dalton, you know, the same guy who came up with the law of multiple proportions, uh, proposed his atomic, his famous uh, atomic theory in 1808. So Dalton's atomic theory was basically composed of four, uh, four parts. The first part says that matter was composed of indestructible particles called atoms. And this was pretty revolutionary at the time. However, nowadays we actually know that atoms can be destroyed. Um, atoms can actually, are actually composed of subatomic particles themselves, protons, neutrons, electrons, which we'll go over in, uh, in another video. But again, you know, at, back in those days, this was pretty revolutionary. Uh, the second part of his atomic theory says that all atoms of a certain element have the same mass and other characteristic properties. And we now, we actually, we now know this to be untrue as well. Uh, nowadays, we know that atoms of the same element can actually have uh, different masses, and we call those isotopes. Um, but he had, you know, Dalton didn't really have any way of knowing this because, again, uh, he had no understanding of uh, subatomic particles. At the time, he thought that the atom was the absolute smallest you could go to, and you couldn't divide that up. Uh, so the third part of the Dalton's atomic theory says that uh, compounds are composed of atoms combined in simple whole number ratios. Again, this was consistent with, you know, law of different uh, proportions and the law of multiple proportions. And then finally, uh, a chemical reaction is a rearrangement of atoms. So in other words, this means that atoms of one element cannot become atoms of another element. And of course, this was before uh, nuclear chemistry became, you know, a big hit. So, you know, this is, again, this is, this holds true for chemical reactions, chemical, re in any chemical reaction, uh, an element cannot become another element, but in nuclear reactions, uh, that can happen. So, um, you know, there was a lot of revisions that still needed to take place, uh, at the time, but again, you know, this was pretty revolutionary because up until this time, people were still, uh, you know, pretty convinced that you could just infinitely divide matter and that there wasn't no, you know, there wasn't any, uh, uh, fundamental, fundamental, <laughs> can't even talk today, fundamental, uh, particle, uh, that we now call the atom. So, uh, I hope this video helped you out a little bit. And, um, in the next couple of videos, I'm going to talk a little bit, um, about subatomic particles and, uh, some of the experiments that, um, that led to their understanding. So, all right, have a good one.